Clive Standen, you've been entering the world of Vikings since the pilot episode. What's your favorite part about coming into that world and that show? Um, I think it's what's incredible about the show is we were able to push the envelope so far. I mean, this is the first time this culture and race of people have been, you know, portrayed on screen in a discursive way. Um, it's been incredible to be able to, to, to actually kind of play characters that, that have for, for many, many years on, on screen and in the media have been portrayed as the, you know, the hired help, the kind of the, the devils who came from the tree and raped and pillaged and murdered everything in, it in their path. But um, in, in not too dissimilar to the, the Sopranos, they've kind of taken one of these characters and put them right at the center of the story as almost a heroic um, character and then I'd say it all around his family and, and, and seen it from his point of view. So we're looking at the history from the inside out, which has been fantastic. Um, and it's History Channel's first scripted show as well. So they uh, they gave us free reign to, to kind of just create and, and, and hopefully make something original to put them on the map. Um, so I feel truly blessed to have been part of it, really. Can you think of a moment that sort of typifies that pushing of the envelope? Oh, well, definitely season one, episode eight, that was directed by Ken Girotti. We, um, we, we approached the, the subject of Uppsala and how the, the Vikings used to sacrifice humans and sacrifice animals. And, and you were really going into the kind of the pagan culture and, and, uh, and, and just, and exploring that with the, you know, the gods and monsters that they, they worshipped. And it really was surreal and otherworldly and, um, unlike anything else on, on TV. And then, you know, another, another moment would be, you know, the, the, the Blood Eagle episode a little bit later on that was directed by Carrie Scogland. Um, what I loved about that is they obviously, the, some of the, the things the Vikings did were brutal and, and there's no, you know, shying away from that. But we always took a Hitchconian kind of point of view on how to, how to film it because we, we never really wanted, you know, the blood and the gore and things to be at the forefront of the story. Um, it's, you know, a lot of that is the, is the backdrop. This is about the family and what they're going through and it's, it's very human and about how humans haven't changed since, you know, the ninth century. Um, so, so that we had to find ways of kind of showing that on screen without, you know, offending anybody and, 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 and keeping to within the, you know, the senses. Um, and we had, I, I was very proud of the episode because people still come up to me now and say, That's, oh, that episode's so hard to watch. It's, it's really graphic and it's, it's really not. Um, because Carrie found a, a, a great way of filming it. She, she had Ragnar Lothbrok describe what the Blood Eagle is, which is, you know, is horrific. It's about, you know, it's the worst thing a Viking can do to another Viking and you know, cutting their back open and pulling their lungs over their, their shoulders and, and their last breath looks like an eagle. Um, and Ragnar describes it to his kids uh, in the most graphic detail, which in itself, uh, you're an adult describing that kind of act to, to children is, is pretty horrific. But uh, when, when it comes to the scene, we chose to keep the camera on everyone watching it. And that's, and that's the kind of key to Vikings in a lot of the, you know, the battles and things. They're, they're always a chance to tell the story, to tell something about a different character. We've got characters that you would never expect fainting, you know, turning away and, 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 and vomiting and you've got some people that are really enjoying it and uh, in a frenzy but you never actually really see very much of, of, of the, the act of violence itself but you think you do because Ragnar has described it to you at the beginning so you know exactly every sound and every you know every movement that's going on and, and you know, off camera. You play a uh, role on the show what's something you think that that character has learnt over the course of the series? Well, oh, he's learning all the time, and that's why I love about the character. I feel like um, it, it was originally written to, for a, a fifty-year-old actor. The one, the one artistic license we take within the history uh, of, of the show is that Ragnar and Rollo weren't brothers in, in history. They they lived um, almost a hundred years apart. But for you know, for the dramatic license, they're the two of the most famous characters in, in, in Viking history. So to put them together in the brother and to be able to show those two stories in the same um, uh, age. It was just a no-brainer. Um, but when, when I got the role, Michael, we knew where he ended up, but Michael just said, look, we've got, we've got one brother. I'm, I'm going to turn, I'm turn this, this character into a brother, make him more your age, because I think that you know, the, the chemistry me and Travis Fimmel had together, he wanted to play off and, and use this mm -hmm. jealousy and, and, this, and this brotherly kind of, you know, I have, my character has a great line in the show, which is, um, isn't that the thing about brothers? They love and hate each other all the time. And, and I kind of feel that's kind of very much my relationship as an actor with Travis Fimmel. He's like a brother from another mother, but we're always, yeah, we're, we're so close to each other. We're, you know, we're literally wrestling with each other all the time, emotionally and physically. Um, and, and I think Michael saw that from day one. So I was able to get this character and throw him on the floor and smash him into a thousand pieces 
and then slowly building back together over season after season. And there's this fantastic Swedish proverb that uh, Johan Renk, the very first director we had for the first three episodes, gave me, which is stuck with me for the character for every episode. And I have it written on the on the makeup mirror in the morning. And it, um, but it, it roughly translates to everybody wants to be loved. And if they can't be loved, they want to be admired. And if they can't be admired, they're willing to be feared. And if they're not feared, then they're willing to be hated. Love, admiration, fear, hatred. Everyone just wants to fit in some way, you know, in this in this weird world that we live in. Um, whether they can get garner fame from being, you know, the, the biggest mob leader, and, and you know, uh, or they can be the president. You know, they, everyone just wants to fit in and be known and 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 be you know, stand up and be counted. And Rollo is one of those characters. You know, he just is trying to reinvent himself. He's just trying to find his way. He's just as m many of us are every day. But he takes his to extremes because to be a Viking, fame is everything, and not in the you know the Kim Kardashian sense of the word. It's, it's about actually truly doing something to make the gods worth you know to make you worthy of joining them in Valhalla. And he's in his brother's shadow all those years. Um, so I, I know where he's going to end up. He's the great 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 grandfather of William the Conqueror. He's an incredible man in the history books. But as but you know, in, in TV, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I've been blessed with a character. I've been able to start at such a base level. Um, and you know, in season one, you do hate him. In season two, my job was to kind of make people love to hate him. In season three, against their will, some people started to root more for Rollo than they did for Ragnar. And the, and the brothers, just as one gets obsessed with his own narcissism and, and ego and the power that he's getting as, as, the, as the leader of the Vikings, the other brother is, is, is almost like the phoenix from the flames and he's rising. And, they're, and they're, you know, the, the trajectory very much crosses. And in season four, when they meet each other on the battlefield, and they're very, it, it very truly is a battle of a battle of the brothers from the audience's point of view just as much as it was on screen people didn't really know who they meant to root for and for a tv show that's quite original you know there is no hero in this show anymore everyone you know sometimes it's just about which bastard do you do you root for more than the other do you reckon rollo at the moment feels more loved admired feared or hated uh in 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 oh. I think he's he's found his people in season four. It's um yeah it's a it's a, there's a, there's the religious conflicts, but he he never really fitted in in Kattegat. He was always in his brother's shadow, and I think now he by leaving Kattegat and the Vikings and joining Francia and and he's finally found that you know, the king of France is is that father figure he's never had someone who actually believes in him, and and I think Rollo is one of those. People that if if you believe in him, he can he can fly. You'll run with it. But he's always been pushed down, especially by Ragnar and his father, even Lagatha. I mean, there's a relationship there um, that was that was long started before Ragnar met Lagatha, and I think he's finally found that 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 kind of form of acceptance, and 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 he's also found Princess Gisela, the, the woman that you know believes in him, uh, which he kind of had with Siggy. With a Jessa and a Gilsig's character, but that was very much a, a marriage of convenience. That was about power again, and and, and it's just you know, a tempestuous affair. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing. It's not it's not whether he's leaving; it's whether he's going home. I always thought that he's in, in history. That's that's where he really shines. And um, it's been an incredible kind of acting challenge as well, because it's almost the opposite of Prince to Pauper. You've got this. You've got this guy. This um. This neanderthal um who's you know as a pagan beast from the fields and he's now learning the the etiquette the, the fashion the religion it's a massive uphill struggle to to get the, the frankish people on his side um also with the impending you know invasion from his brother that's gonna there is no going back anymore his brother knows that he's betrayed him they're, you know, they're coming they're coming not only to take paris but this is a personal thing for ragnar he wants to kill his brother rollo never wanted to kill ragnar Rollo just wants to be accepted. He wants to fit in. He wants to find his people. And, he, and it's about, it's not that he stole Paris from Ragnar, it's that he, he took it first. Now, you said that he often feels in the shadow of his brother Ragnar. Where do you think this character is left with in a Viking's world post-Ragnar? Um, well, I, th I think when you're... When you're brought up on a, on a religion that is ex extreme as, as paganism, I don't think it's ever going to really leave you. I don't think. I think there is very much the, the businessman inside Rollo. 
I think there's you know, the religion was something he had to take on in order you know, to, to, to seal the deal. But you know, there's that great line, I think, that Michael wrote for me in season four, which is when he turns around to his wife and he says, when you hear thunder, it is only thunder. But when I hear thunder, it is Thor beating his anvil. And, and that's, that's very much sums him up. His, his, his gods are always inside him. And then what you get from that is the conflict. Yeah, because religion is a very powerful thing. You, he starts to think, you know, where where is he going to end up in the afterlife? And that's where I'm, I'm. I am in season five now. I've been shooting some scenes in season five, and what's been fantastic about uh, being able to play a character like Rollo is that they've they've let us have the whole of the trajectory of the character to ourselves. I'm a 35 year old actor, and I've played Rollo from the age of 30, so I'm now playing him at the age of 66 years old. Um, you know, with with help of makeup and. Um, but but it's it's a it's a fantastic character development, and he's now in the later stages of his life, so the latter stage of his life, actually starting to think you know about his own mortality and where he ends up, and and it's a, it's a true story with the real Rollo in history. There was a there was documentation about how yeah because he died of old age. He sat down and uh, he had a hundred Christians sacrificed in front of him, but at the same time sent a hundred pounds in weight of gold to the to the Christian churches. So this is a man hedging his bets. He's terrified of Odin. And he's terrified of God. He doesn't know where he's going to end up. So he's trying to hedge his bets as most as he can. And with the role I've played in the show, he's made so many bad choices that he's now trying to be, you know, he's being held accountable for them with his own conscience. So, you know, it's, it's a very, you know, duplicitous character, but he's also very, very, you know, I don't know he's a live wire. He's unhinged. Um, and you said that uh, for you, Travis, in some ways felt like a brother as well, working with him on the show. What is it like for you with him having left the show and not getting to work with him anymore on Vikings? Well, that was, it was, tra- it was staged in, in season four because the brothers in the storyline took a very different uh, path. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm in, I'm in, all my scenes are set in France, in Rouen, in Paris, and, and Ragnar is in Kattegat and in and England. And, and uh, and we never actually on set saw each other for a very long time. We would hang out and we would we would you know, tear the script apart and talk to each other and, and work through it that way outside of work. Um, but on set, I never really saw. I you know I'd, 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 I'd talk to him about his scenes. I'd I'd see it on the page, but I didn't actually see his work, which was was strange for us because from season one to three, we were nearly in everything together. So it was very much a massive collaboration. But in season four. He was he was doing his thing. I was doing my thing. So the moment when we actually meet on the battlefield, with all of that tension, all of those emotions going, was the very first time I'd actually seen Travis on set, dressed as Ragnar. I mean, the storyline he had with the drugs he was taking with the with um, Yidu, I hadn't seen. I I I'd, I'd read the scripts, but I hadn't seen what he'd done with them. And Travis, <laughs> with, with 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 Travis as an actor, he tends to do almost the opposite of what's on the screen, which is what makes Ragnar so electric. Um, so you, you have no idea what, what what's going to end up on the page of the screen when it, when it comes to Travis Fimmel. Um, so all of those those emotions were, were were pretty real. It was the first time, and when he jumps into the screen and he says, uh, "You look like a bitch," uh, it wasn't it wasn't an improvised line, but but it it came from a place of you know, he he hadn't actually seen what Rollo looked like and all his gold and finery. This is the first time he'd seen the costume, the you know, the, the, the hair and. Um, so it was, yeah, it was fantastic. It kind of brought a new dynamic to our relationship. Yeah. Um, what, what, what for you on the show has been the most challenging thing you've had to do? I think it's just an all encompassing show where we, we throw ourselves into it. I mean, it's, it's, we, we don't have stunt doubles in this show and I'm not talking about stunts as though, but it's just everything, the, the, the climate, we're up there, we're at the top of these mountains in, in extreme weather. Um, we're, you know, we're on the battlefield getting smacked around, knocked around and, and there's, there's big emotions in this show. I remember, I remember in season three, I, I had a fight scene with, with Alexander Ludwig and it's not only the choreography, the rain machine, the atmosphere, all the extras shouting and screaming. This man has just lost his, his, well, his, his woman and, 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 and it's his fault. The last time he went away, he was smashing up their house and almost physically abusing her because this is a man, my character is a character that, that suffers from depression and, and, and he he almost uses pain as a as a form of of of, of self harm. You know, when some people cut themselves or burn themselves to to get away from the emotional pain, they feel physical pain. 
Rollo is very much like that too. He uses fighting on the battlefield or getting punched in the face as, as a form of as a pain he understands. He doesn't like feeling the emotional pain. So when he finds out that, that Siggy is dead, he, he, he goes to the bottle straight away. But he's, he's, he's on the brink, I think, um, when, when his nephew comes along and um, he, he, wants, he wants to be knocked out. He wants to be punched into a... And to, to, to be obliterated so we can stop feeling this emotional pain. So we've got all those emotions going on as an actor while you're learning the choreography for a fight, while you've got the rain machines and people screaming and shouting and take off to take. It's a very extreme show. And the episode that I'm guesting in in, in the second half of season four, um, I, I have a scene where I get drowned. Um, and I get fed up of seeing these actors that just put a little bit of water in their mouth and they go, <coughs> and the water spits out. I drank nine bottles of, of mineral water. Um, didn't eat anything all day because I wanted when I got thrown onto that um, that the, the deck of the boat to just spew up water. And there's something kind of quite this is quite rollo about the whole thing about how he's they've tried their best to keelhaul him and drown him under the boat. And as they pull him up, he's unconscious. He's spewing up water. He's in so much pain. He's still laughing because somehow the gods still favour him. Um, so I always try and take it to you know to that next level. I always try and give it everything and. Um, and, and it's supported by Michael Hurst's writing, and, and, and you know, we look, thankfully have the crew and the support um, mechanisms around us to be able to do that. Yeah, it's, what, it's, it's, oh, sorry. What, what has been the most fun thing you've gotten to do on the show or just the most fun thing from just the set from shooting it? The most fun thing? It's, it's been the research, really. It's it's this is a this is a part of history that really hasn't been explored very much, but it's all out there. I mean, we were lucky enough. I went to I went to Rouen and I went to where Rollo was buried and went into the cathedral where he is and, and was lucky enough to go and, and look down where the winter camps were in the River Seine and 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 hold some of the, the the artifacts they found where the winter camps were, which is where Rollo is at the beginning of of, of season four when he's 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 holding camp with the, the Vikings that stayed behind, and holding you know, swords and and brooches and things that come from the era. And then from that trip, I went on to Iceland, which is where I learned about all of the sagas, uh, which is where you know where it all gets otherworldly and and it's all about the gods and and, and serpents and and the stories of Odin and. and um, and all the uh, and Thor, and, but uh, it, it, it's incredible out there. The landscape is like nothing else. It's like being on the moon or something. Um, and to actually go and look at the culture from the inside out, and, 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 and on a show like this, this is what I love about being an actor. You, you're, you're, you're fortunate enough to, to be able to, to be in the presence of great historians to, that will sit down with you and, and, and tell you these things, tell you the stories, show, show you artifacts that, that if you were in the general public, you wouldn't even be allowed to be in the room. It would be in a glass container. and. and fingering through books that have got the very first words from Lindisfarne, you know, spoken about Rollo and Ragnar. And so that's what I get the buzz out of. I'm a big history geek and to actually kind of, you know, it, I mean, I'm still doing it now. And anything that comes on the television or at any museum uh, has, has you know, a Vikings exhibition. I'm the first there in line. Um, and it's, it's, it's all encompassing. It's kind of taken over my life a little bit. Mm, I remember uh, when I was uh, with my family in Yorkshire, going to all the Viking museums and things like that there, which is like so much fun to like explore that world that I had never really thought about much before. Yeah. I You're remember as well when I was a kid though as well, I used to go up and down the length and breadth of, of England. We didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up. It was always, you know, let's, let's, let's go to another historical British town where there's ruins and cathedrals and you know, monasteries. And when you're a kid, it's kind of boring. You're kind of brass rubbing and learning about another castle. With a, you know, with another sheriff or the you know, or Robin Hood or whatever it is, but when you grow up, it that that it always stays in the back of your head. And there's and but with Vikings, I always had, I had always had an opinion of the Vikings. But now that opinion, I think, is the same as many of us. It's just that this this is this is a culture far uh, deeper than than just you know colonizing and 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 raiding. And it's it's a rich culture. And 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 I think people that's what people have embraced in the show. It's Still waters run deep. Yes. Now, you also, your other television project is Taken that you're working on. What is it like juggling that and Vikings? Well, it's tough. I mean, one character is very selfish and the other character is completely selfless. Uh, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, it's nice to be able to reinvent a character. I think we've taken what we're, we're doing is it's, it's, it's a modern day origin story. We've taken the character of Brian Mills, played by Liam Neeson, and thought about what, what he was like before he became you know, the 
the slightly jaded kind of OCD, you know, intense, you know, retired grizzled veteran of the CIA. So it's about him on the journey. And it's nice to have a character that, I mean, I get bored. I get bored by action films that are just sound and fury signify nothing, just, you know, action and explosions and things. And, and my, my big thing about acting is that I come from a theater background. And what I love about the theater is when we're in the audience, the first thing that we do when the lights go down and the spotlight comes on on the stage and an actor, you know, walks on stage, we all shut up and we all lean forward on our seats. And in theater, the, the actor has the audience from the beginning where his to lose and sometimes they do. But, but in, the, in the cinema, when we go and see an action film, for sure, the first thing we do when, when the lights go down is we lean back on our chairs and we slide down and we wait to be entertained. And no amount of explosions or car chases or you know, intense stunt sequences, the back of stunt guys' heads because the actor's not doing it himself, none of that pulls us out of our seats, just makes us eat popcorn quicker. But great action and great characters, where when, when you're driving the story through the action, when you're learning about characters because you're a fly on the wall and you're learning something about them that they, they wouldn't portray in public, that's what makes you come forward and you see. That's what engages you. And it's tough in an action franchise. And I get bored by these action heroes that are just flawless. I love James Bond. It's one of my favorites, but it's uh, but that's pure escapism for me. He's per perfect in every way. He has the he has the witty line to say to the woman and the evil villain. He's immaculately dressed. You know, the, the, some of them have all, some of these action. Ethan Hunt and Mission Impossible is all about technological gadgets and things, and uh, it's larger than life again. But I, what I love about Brian Mills and what Liam Neeson did was he's just a dad with an extraordinary well with a particular set of skills. Um, but at the heart of it, he's just a man. He will do anything to get his daughter back. And that, for a TV show, when we start talking about building it over hours and hours and season after season, it enables me to be able to think about giving him some flaws. You know, and I don't see them as flaws so much. You know, I want my Brian Mills to be someone who doesn't know how to hold chopsticks properly. You know, he, he, he sees a woman that he likes and his, the cat gets his tongue and he gets nervous, doesn't know what to say. You know, and, and outside, he's, you know, he's trained with an inch of his life. So we see him being you know, the, the, the gun-toting badass you know, action man. But, but he's the kind of guy that's just too busy being selfless and looking after other people that he leaves his washing in the washing machine for three days. It's clean, but it starts to get dank and smells a little bit because he has other priorities in his life. That's the guy I want to see on screen. I don't want to see a, I don't want to see a guy or a girl smashing through a window, sliding along broken glass and getting up and going <sighs> like it was you know, in, a, in a hair commercial. I'm getting bored of all that. And I think a lot of people out there, I always think if I think something, there must be other people out there that think it too. And I just want to bring take him into making it about life is life is interesting enough as it is. We don't need to put a veneer of gloss on everything all the time. Can so you remember why. can you remember the first performance you saw that made you come forward like that that really like sparked that like response from you? That's a good question. Um, Kenneth Branagh in Henry V, his St. Crispin's Day speech I saw when I was, I don't know, I was an early teenager. And that kind of really made me want to act. Um, and he stands on that, the, the, the wagon and, you know, each of you who fights with me today will be my brother. That one. It makes you just, he's so simple, Kenneth Branagh, and, and he, he just speaks the words and, and draws you in. It's about letting them come to you. It's another theatre thing, I think. It's about, you know, so many, so many t television actors almost force the story on you, or maybe it's the editing, but it's, sometimes it's, it's best just to let the audience come to you. You draw an audience in, coax them, um, rather than just, ah, and, 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 you know. But yeah, that's the first thing that comes to my head. I remember that moment. I remember just watching that and going, I want to do this. <laughs> and, how, and how old were you again when you saw it? I'm trying to think. I mean, it was before I went to college, so I was probably about 14 years old. Yeah. Cool. Um, to, yeah. To, to wrap up, Clive, you said that like on your makeup uh, mirror, it uh, has the quote about love, uh, admiration, fear, and hatred, and that's sort of what drives 
your character Rolo, his desire for people to view him in those four ways, how do you think he treats others more from those four? Does he treat others with love, admiration, fear, or hatred? Well, it's, I don't think you can really box a character up. I mean, the thing about Rollo is um, he's it's what he does when he gets up. He's always trying to better himself. He's always trying to fit in and be accepted. And I think it depends how, you know, treat people as you like to be treated yourself. I mean, if you think about the different relationships he has, I th people think he's a, he's a traitor towards Ragnar, and he definitely is to an extent, but that's not my job. My job is, is never to judge him. My job is to ask very harsh questions of myself sometimes when I, I'm, you know, I'm presented with his choices and, and then put my results up on the screen, what's and all for other people to judge. But, but I do sit there and I sit and I look at the, going back to the very first episodes is that, Rollo is the one that gets disfigured. He has the, you know, the Chelsea smile. Earl Haraldson, Gabriel Byrne's character, cuts his face to pieces because Rollo will not tell him where his brother Ragnar is hiding out. He stands up in court and swears against his ar armoury. He lies about protecting Lagatha and, and Ragnar, um, which would be treason. And Ragnar would have been hung and killed. Uh, he says he does it for Lagna, uh, Lagatha, but he doesn't. He does it for his brother. He, he, there's many times within the first season and the second season that Rollo really steps out on the limb for his brother, and he's never rewarded for it. And after a while, if you you know if you kick a dog enough times, it's going to bite. Um, and and the first you know Jarlberg, Jarlborg comes along, um, Torbjorn Har's character, and at the beginning of season two, and he fights against him. And he can't kill his brother. He has every opportunity to kill Ragnar, and he cannot do it because it's not about that at this stage for him. He just wants his brother to look at him in the same way he looks at other people. He wants to be accepted and he throws the spear down and then he has to deal with all the consequences of his actions. And then he's back on side again. It's only when the king of France offers him everything he's ever dreamed of on a plate that that's when he finally caves in and, and has to go on the other side. But I challenge you and the audience to think of any opportunity that Ragnar's really done anything for Rollo over those years, apart from obviously not kill him for betraying him. And he doesn't kill him for betraying him because he knows deep down that that you know, he's never really done anything. He wants to keep Rollo side. It's one thing about Rollo is that you don't, you may not like him, but you don't want to fight against him. And Ragnar is the first to acknowledge that. Ragnar is very mercurial. He's like a tornado, but Rollo is a volcano. If he explodes, then the consequences are you know, catastrophic. Well, Clive Stan, and thank you so much for talking with us about Vikings and Taken today. All the best of luck for the Emmys and the best drama uh, actor, a guest actor category and for the future of vikings yes and uh, season five is coming out soon and it's going to be a there's a lot of characters that are reinvented in that season um that are, that are, that are, that are doing things that you'd never imagine you and, and, and it's a really great um reward for the fans that have watched it from season one this the characters are going full circle and and, and i love that about life because something about life is very cyclical you know it's it's very the loop is complete and definitely with ragnar lagatha um, and, and Bjorn, there's, you know, life has kind of gone full circle for these characters now and it's, it's quite rewarding for the fans. Mm. Oh, cool. Thanks.